Only three nights ago, this blackened patch of earth was the scene of tragedy. On that night, a man died. Other men, though they may never realize it, became heroes. And there were the fools as well, the curious, the thrill seekers, those people who find disaster the perfect setting to satisfy, well, whatever it is they want to satisfy. These men are collecting the charred bits and pieces of what was once a military aircraft. The investigators have already finished their job of mapping the site, numbering each twisted fragment and its location. Later, when the plane is reassembled, they'll perform a sort of autopsy in an attempt to discover the cause or causes of its death. That's the important thing, the cause. When this question is answered, it may prevent countless other accidents, other deaths. But that's not really our story. We're concerned, rather, with the accident itself, with what occurred during those hours before the military investigators arrived, with civil authorities everywhere who may be called upon at any time to respond to the scene of a military air disaster. This particular evening began, curiously enough, with laughter, singing and dancing, with an overture. Sheriff, right away, will you? Uh, don't ask questions, Edna. Just give me the sheriff like I asked. Joshua Spring Sheriff's Office. Uh, Jim, is this you? I'm sorry, the sheriff isn't in right now. This is Deputy Nelson. Oh, uh, Tom, listen, something terrible has just happened. I'm so nervous, I, I can't even talk. Uh, who is this? Oh, uh, this is Carl Davis, and I'm over at the hideaway. Uh, a big airplane just crashed into the into the mesa across the highway from uh, from my ranch. I don't know how bad it is yet, but uh, 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 you better get everything you can and get it over here right away. Now, hold on, Mr. Davis. I'll get on the radio to Ed Graham. He's patrolling somewhere in that area. Frank, there's a plane crash out by the Davis Ranch. Can you get a hold of the hospital and the fire chief? Were you able to tell what kind of a plane it was, Mr. Davis? No, I don't know. One airplane from another. I... All I got was just a glimpse of it as it went into, in, when it crashed in a big ball of fire. But it sounded like one of those military planes that fly around here all the time. Well, we'll get help out there as soon as we can, Mr. Davis. Uh, it would be a great help if you'd try to go over there and try and keep the people away from the wreck. There's no sense in anybody getting hurt. Yeah, o okay, fine, Tom, but make it fast, will you? Unit 3, Control 1. Unit 3, Control 1. Unit 3, do you copy? Control 1. Hey, mister, someone wants to speak to you. Reckon there's no rest for the weary on Saturday night. Look, I'll bet you Miss Janie's ever decided to head for town again, huh? <laughs> Thanks, son. Unit 3, do you copy? Control 1. Control 1, this is Unit 3. Unit 3, what is your location? Uh, Highway 39, Georgia's gas station. What's up? There's an airplane down right in the middle of Jackrabbit Mesa. No further details. Proceed code 3, control 1. 10-4, en route code 3. Ron, we got a roll. Assistance is being dispatched, control 1. Gonna be such a dull night after all, huh? Can we go see Daddy? Ah, you bet we can, boy. 
Hey, Bill. How's the station, huh? I told you I heard strange noises a while back, but no, you wouldn't listen. That must have been when that airplane came crashing down. Ah, Jenny, you're always hearing noises. Are you boys allowed to see something tonight you've never seen before in your life? Jenner. Yeah. Right, I've got it all. Have you called the military yet? It might be one of theirs. Good. Now, you've got a copy of that government pamphlet on aircraft accidents. You follow those reporting procedures and give the military all the information you have. And tell Frank to stay there at the station. I'll pick you up on my way to the Mesa. Right. Kid you not. Please, come on, we won't cause any trouble. No, you're both gonna stay here. I've got a feeling I'll have all the people I can handle. See if you can find the drivers of some of those cars across the road and line as many as you can up along this side of the highway with the headlights this way, huh? Over here. Right. Hey, you people, come back here. You can't do anything up there. No, not me. Don't push me around. Lego, you Lego. Okay. You got no right stopping us. My kids are up there. Chester, Ricky, it's Mama. You come back here. This is how it often begins. Panic. Utter confusion. No rhyme. No reason. A heyday for that thrill seeker we spoke of. A nightmare for those who must maintain control. For Ed Graham, a dozen lifetimes will seem to pass in those few minutes before additional help arrives. Yet he knows what must be done. Anything I can do to help Ed? Well, I think we better start a search for the pilot. Maybe you can get a couple friends to help. Frankly, I don't think anybody could have survived this, but there's just the chance he might have bailed out. Ray? Fellas? Ray and I will search over this way. Why don't you all go on up here and see what you can find? But don't right. cross in front of that wreck. There might be rockets or missiles aboard. Caution must be used whenever it's necessary to reach the aircraft along the crash path. Already many of the spectators have trampled through the area, destroying valuable evidence, picking up souvenirs. For even a piece of an instrument panel, a twisted hunk of metal, a scratch in the earth, can provide significant clues to the cause of the accident. Thank God you're here. Deputy Graham's up there by the wreck. Any survivors? I don't know, but there's a bunch of our people up there. We couldn't keep them back. But even more important is the fact that survivors may be thrown into the crash path and, if not noticed, could be trampled upon or run over by vehicles. You see if you can help Ed keep those people away from the plane, huh? And go along, Ned. Jesse, there's some rope and stakes in the trunk of my car. Why don't you set up a barricade this side of the highway? No one's to cross it, understand? Right. And I'd appreciate it if you can get those folks to go on home. Sure. But keep some of the men around, because I may need them later. OK. Oh, and Tom, you're going over to Fort Point and set up a roadblock. We've got enough people here already. Any time life, Ed? So far, nothing. Nothing at all. I'll see if I can find some more men. Ed! Yeah? Ed, I think I found something.
you got? Down here. Ambulance, Ed. Right, Jim. Well, I guess that answers one question. Yeah, what? Nobody survived. No one should ever assume that there's only one person in an aircraft. In this case, there was another pilot who did get out alive, ejecting only seconds before the crash. He's injured and in shock, and somebody should be looking for him. George, let me have it. Sure, why not? Just figured maybe my boys would get a kick out of it, that's all. If you ever got it home to them. What do you mean, if I ever got it home to them? Just because this thing didn't go off and the plane crashed doesn't mean it wouldn't blow up right in your face now or when, you, when your kids are playing with it later. My kids? It's live ammunition. You wouldn't let them play with a live grenade, would you? This stuff is made to blow things up and kill people with. Ah. Now listen here, you people. You've been asked to get back the highway. Now I'm telling you. We just want to look around. Oh, no, get back the highway, you two kids. We you heard me, all of you. Back the highway. Back. Get back. George! George! Well, I'm in trouble. Let's go. Get out of the way. Bring a stretcher up here, quick! Johnny, can't you hear me? Please hear me, Joe. I'm sorry, Mrs. Wilson. I tried my best to warn him to stay away. Oh, <laughs> Secondary fires and explosions are always a hazard at a crash scene. Volatile materials or ordnance may be scattered over a wide area and their ignition, if not triggered by the existing blaze, awaits only the introduction of a carelessly discarded cigarette or match. All right, folks, move back. Come on, room. Oh, my God, do
got in your way. Can you tell us what happened? Surely you can tell us how bad it really is, Sheriff. Tell us, uh, is there anyone dead? The Air Force information officer will be here soon. You can ask him your questions. Did you see the crash? No, I was in town. Ask the people down there. Apparently, the pilot ejected too late. He's dead? Anyone find out his name? I wouldn't tell you that if I knew it. What about the man they took away? I hardly knew him. He was one of the spectators. You think it'd be all right if we took pictures up close? Well, I wish you wouldn't, but I can't stop you. I'd rather have you wait till the military gets here. Besides, we've already had a couple of explosions. There's always the chance you'll hurt yourselves. Well, uh, we'll be careful. In case of a military air disaster, questions which might be otherwise answered must by necessity remain mysteries, for the moment at least. At no time are the responsibility and integrity of the press put more to the test than at the scene of a calamity. For the rescuers at the scene to speculate on the cause of an accident would be ridiculous, nothing more than guesswork. To release the names of the seriously injured or dead before the notification of their next of kin would cause only needless anxiety and heartbreak. Photographing equipment that may be classified is unnecessary. Photos that depict mutilated bodies can only cause revulsion without adding to the information about an accident. Good taste and security are the guidelines to be considered by public officials and newsmen alike. Naturally, civil authorities should and in most cases do cooperate with the press. But it's the information officer who's the most reliable spokesman at the scene. He's the only one trained and authorized to release facts, not personal opinions, not hearsay. With the arrival of these officers and men, the job is ended for the civil authorities. For the military investigators, it's just a beginning. The beginning of weeks of work before the true cause of this tragic accident is learned. Like a giant jigsaw puzzle, each piece of evidence will be fitted together. Testimony will be heard. Many witnesses will be called. For a single statement from one may provide the answer to that all-encompassing question, why? move him. Can't tell how badly he's hurt. You go ahead to the gas station, call the hospital. When Captain O'Brien awakens, he will be told that his fractured ankle has been properly set, that his wife is on her way to his bedside, and that he's a very, very lucky man. Later, the local emergency medical center will submit a bill to the nearest military hospital. Payments for all such emergency care, treatment, and services even the hiring of guards at the crash site will be assumed by the military. There's little left now to remind us of the frightful event that took place here. No one likes to remember such scenes, but one thing we must remember. Today, the military of the United States holds an enviable air safety record. Yet, despite all the safety programs, all the inspections, the improved maintenance, Aircraft accidents can and do occur at any time, any place. That's why they've prepared this pocket-sized pamphlet. Get one, read it, keep it. 
Like our story, it may not provide all the answers, for we all know there are no stock solutions to most problems. We must instead rely on our own individual judgments. Or is it just plain common sense? I think so. And I think you'll agree that although it certainly was not a, a universal trait with all those who were present during those awful hours, we still saw a great deal of common sense at work that tragic night here on Jackrabbit Mesa. <laughs>